Hello, my fellow Brappentonians, and welcome to the Brap Talk Social Hour. This is a weekly video cast where we talk about motorcycles, life, the universe, and everything. I am your host, Jensen Beeler of Asphalt and Rubber, and joining me on this two-wheeled adventure, I have no idea where he is. He's late. He's so very, very late. We're going to give him such a hard time. My habanero to my spicy sauce. Mr. Shaheen Alvandi! <laughs> um, okay, looking at the screen, you're not Shaheen. You're Rennie Skaysbrook of nah. Cycle News, Pikes Peak fame. You're our special guest this week. Rennie, thank you for being on time to our uh, little social media. Hey, that was here. one hell... That was one hell of an intro. Far Dude, out. That's what I'm saying. I gotta, I gotta improve my game. It's the mole tool talking. Oop, how do I get there? There it is. Yeah. So I, I got the the big wave stuff. So I'm not. I'm the the wave isn't big enough by the sounds of it. <laughs> uh, how are you, sir? You just um you just hopped off a live stream of your own to hop on a live stream with myself and Shaheen. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I um, I, I funnily enough, we have jumped on this live stream bandwagon at about the same time, yeah. I, I think. And um, uh, yeah, so I I got got to sit down for an hour and a half with the guy who's like my all time hero in uh, in Wayne Rainey um so yeah it was really cool we we went through uh, all the like, current state of motor America and um what I mean I feel really bad for those guys and because those guys 2020 was going to be a big year for them. still is going to be a big year for them but yeah they've obviously had to just pander to lo so many local governments really because everyone with the COVID-19 thing it's always this person's doing that, that person's doing that, and, you know, no spectators, spectators, whatever it is. To the, um, but then, yeah, we got into a bit of a career retrospect and started at the beginning and how we got into road racing and, um, you know, like dude rocks up and starts winning road racing straight away kind of deal in club racing. And then, you know, within three years, he's in 250 GPs or Moto2 and, um, and you know, comes back to the States, smokes everybody in the Superbike Championship and then he's in the in the 500s and that's where everyone kind of knows him. But then he, he it was super interesting because then he got into really in-depth um, talking on his accident and all the stuff that had, that had happened leading up to the accident during and then after and the rehab and I mean, it gives me goosebumps kind of thinking about it, just a, an incredible human being. Yeah, I can't imagine coming back from an accident like that. Like I can't imagine the, I mean, the physical side of it's obviously huge, but the, the mental side of it, it's got to be amazing. Is. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. That's a, that's the thing with, with him, like with top level races, I mean, well, top level races, top level human beings, it doesn't really matter what you're in. If it's business or if you're a doctor or you're a sportsman, whatever it is that takes a ton of now rule, you know, like you gotta be doing something for 10,000 hours to be really really that it's a huge amount of dedication you obviously got to be naturally talented but he's such a uh, stuff and gets it done and just doesn't want to rest until me this me this great story out. about um trying to beat his teammates like if you're my you're my teammate <laughs> you ain't beat me it's like i train you I'll, I'll like whatever and he made a point of being on cold tires so that First five laps, he just off. Oh. Yeah. Amazing listening to the to the stories. I mean, I could have spoken about an hour and a half. It was uh, it was really really huh. cool. That's rad. Uh, I got to go back and watch the uh, the whole feed because you know there's I think it was like a ninety minute call or hour twenty something like that. Yeah, I was originally going to go go for about half, half an hour, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I just kept going. I'm not going to tell him to shut yeah, up. Yeah. Like, keep going like the or tell them ins and outs of bike changes and chassis changes and first years of understanding and then why flex is important in chassis design and uh, instead of just making everything rock hard and working and he was telling us a story about how Olin's one year made super th thick heavy fork and when really big axles as well and he goes basically the whole front of the it wouldn't compress under braking. So like he'd be, he'd get on the brakes and nothing had happened. Like it would slow down, but there'd be no weight transfer. So he's getting no grip on the front tire, throw him down the road. And so just a, yeah, incredible, uh, incredible chat with a guy. It's someone I'm very, uh, very happy to have done for huh. sure. 
That's crazy. Uh, we had Shaheen and then we lost Shaheen. What happened there? I don't know. Techno Where's technology. He going? It's killing me. Um, uh, we'll just, we'll just keep pressing on without him. Um, I just saw that, uh, they're looking like they're going to be racing in, in Moto America soon. Yeah. 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 So I think there's, there's tenant, they, they haven't actually formally announced it yet. Um, so he kept it a bit under his chest, but I think there's going to be rounds starting in June. Um, I'm not privy to the, where they're going to be. Um, a scoop? I'll give you a yeah. scoop. Come on. Come on, scoop. Come here. Come here a little bit closer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're going to be making your way no. out to Wisconsin, I think. Yeah, the Road America. Yeah. So, But they're, I think they're going to be no spectator rule. Uh, that sounds right. So, yeah. I mean, that's going to be tough. Like, yeah. how are you going to do it with spectators? Well, I mean, again, you, you, the, while people are, while this particular part of America is like, yeah, no spectators. There's going to be other parts of America. They're going to say, yeah, you can have spectators. I think the big, the blue ribbon event for them this year is going to be the return to Laguna Seca. Um, when they have the, the week long, um, Monterey speed motorcycle festival. I'm not sure exactly what the tag, exact term. Uh -huh. It's going to be the, uh, it's going to be a big event for them. Uh, obviously sadly like this year, which really sucks. So it's going to be, uh, Calif Southern California at least because um, you have the round happening up at the Bazaar. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so anyone living south of there is going to be the biggest Moto America event pretty much for the, for the West Coast, really. For the West Coast, really. Like, there's not, there's, I mean, unless you, because I think Utah's been axed from this year as well. So, uh, um, big crowds and, you know, Monterey and the the summertime is a pretty sweet place, so you can bet. <laughs> yeah, I'll be I'm very curious um, to see how Laguna goes, especially with uh, uh, the bagger race that kind of got called out by um, your old boss <laughs> and uh, uh, oh, by, by uh, Paul. By Paul. And uh, so I think I have to show up now and watch that. That uh, oh, you that can't race. know that. It's going to be hilarious. It's going to be something. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure what word it's going to be, but it's going to be something. Um, well, Willie from Dais is building a bagger at the moment. You're a journalist. You should know all the words. I think I think I can get Shaheen in here in just a second. Um, what what's Willie building? I, I saw a seat pan the other day, and um, uh, I don't know a bunch of. I think I don't know who's writing it or anything but he keeps saying bagger <laughs> racer so i mean i i've i've seen and there's only one race you can race a bagger in so um it's gonna be interesting a bagger oh uh, yeah it'll be an interesting one to watch do you think do you think there's gonna be a good competition or do you think someone's gonna run away with it i don't even know who's racing um if, if you have any is a professional racer i mean the obvious choice would be Buddy Carl Wyman, you see how that guy gets on and just light lights it up like a like a fatty. So it's uh, um, it's going to be interesting to see who actually does front the grid, but because you know you're putting, putting his own, own championship and championship and magic, magic, magic getting, getting mangled in a bag of racing and ruining your Moto America, Moto America think, season. But yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure there'll be the there'll be the odd fast, fast guy that's going to turn up. That's going to turn up. There's probably going to be the guys, the guys the who aren't going to go very fast. Now, go Shaheen, very fast. we have you now. You're on the you're on the show. You have, you have me. me. You're here. We I'm did here. it. It's, I'm it's here. Working. Working. I'm so proud. Uh, proud. I think it's working. I think we like broke the stream while we were in the process of it. Right. Um, <laughs> I might have to reboot the software because that's just how live television works. Oh, what's going on? Uh, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, how it's, how it's been our luck so far, I think. Or I think but there we go. I think there that's how the professionals go. do Perfect. it. Easy peasy. Doing squeezy. Well, we've been we've been talking a little bit of racing, a little bit of Wayne Rainey, and uh, a little bit of Moto America. Um, did you get your nice. beverage? Are you ready to go? I've I've got I've got a whiskey. I've, I've got great. I've great. got a whiskey and a um. So Rennie, I mean, I like just talking about yourself for a little bit. You're kind of a big deal. Um. Kind of you're a, you're my second favorite. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you're thanks, my second guys. favorite motorcycle Bless journalist. You. Bless you. Um, you're like one of the fastest guys. Uh, Troy, see him because he's so adorable. 
<laughs> you just put them in your just put them in your pocket. You can feed them an M and M. I just that, carry, I just carry them in my arms. That, 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 that's that's where we're all tangled. Nice nice. Yeah, exactly. Nice. That's what I was telling. That's what I was telling Joe. I was like, can we, can we just have my faves here, my besties? Um, but uh, uh, you're probably known best outside of your work for for cycle news as being one of the fastest guys up uh, Pikes Peak ever on a motorcycle. Yeah, year, so that was so last year. So that, that was, was um, that was nice. Um, I mean, it was um, it was nice. It was nice to get the record. Obviously, obviously we all know, know the end result. Result wasn't wasn't, wasn't, wasn't real nice. Um, yeah, yeah. The Pikes has been has been Pikes and inadvertently part, part, um, um, you know, part of my life. A huge part of my. You know, I was you know I was very lucky to get, to get the chance. Um, to do I had um, I had a. I had a <laughs> No, Oscar, Oscar Solis. No, Oscar Solis at Pirelli. Pirelli is, is, you, know, you know, Oscar and David just to give each other, each other a chat, chat and whatever, whatever. talking on the phone. And he was like, talking yeah, on the phone. And he was like, yeah, you know, you burned like, 40,000 40, dollars, dollars of tires over five years. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> thanks, dude. <laughs> but, but, no, the no, is, Pikes is one of those, those and forever, forever sad that it stopped for Pikes. I mean, I hope to, you know, I hope to God it does start again. I, I can't say that happening, happening, but but um, it, it's, it's been an amazing it's event. Been certainly, it's certainly something, something that, that uh, uh, you know, I'm you know, very thankful, thankful that, that I got the chance, chance to do. To do. Um, very happy I got the chance to win it. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's a it's, it's a, a tragedy. tragedy obviously, Carl, obviously, Carl is, tra- is a huge tragedy, but it's also a great tragedy for racing in general. And the okay. variety of racing that we have that it has stopped. I'm that hoping it has praying, that praying that somebody go, that somebody go, go that they go. No, no, screw, screw it. Excited excited again. I hope someone goes out there and goes faster than someone I did. Goes out there and goes faster than I did. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, how do you feel about their motorcycles not, you know, being on the course? Do you think that's the right decision? No, 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 no. I think it sucks. I think it sucks. Um, there's, I mean, like, I was like, to race the Isle of Man TT. There's, I mean, like, I was signed this year. Um, you know, they're yeah, next year, but, like, you know, and I like I mean, I'll that. be there next year. You know, I like that danger. The, I mean, it sounds like a, I hate the word bloody death wish because it's not that at all. It's got nothing to do with that. It's, it's a totally, you have to work to the elements. You have to be conscious of where you have to be able to take it a little bit easy. Um, it's not like going to Fontana or you just screw the thing on and if you lose the front, you're just going to slide for a million miles. Like you, you have to change your mindset a little bit, um, the race because you do the fan fest, for example, on, um, the um, or practice, whatever it was, uh, they switched qualifying around this year, but you know, would come out and there'd be 25,000 people in downtown Colorado and, you know, we'd stick the kids in the buffs and firing the bikes up and scaring kids and they'd laugh time. And, um, and that to me was what a motorsport event really should be because it's, uh, you're bringing, it's kind of, it's almost a bit like the supercross mentality. You know, you come in the race of the people, the festival, get them track out to the middle of nowhere and Chuck Waller or whatever it is that you got a motorbike in the, in a dust storm. So, um, because, but now, I mean, and we had every practice session, well, around quarter to five, five o'clock, just as the go over the mountain, and, and uh, um. We can't crash. No one crash. Think it was basically an insurance thing. Um, you know, if someone gets hurt or worse, this thing stops for every race meeting. And they said it to us before every practice session. Every um, uh, it was. Uh, there were a lot of things that went on, and I think also like the fact Carlin was the one who went down. Just the biggest name. And they use a name everybody knows. It's like you know, and everyone knew Carlin as Mr. Pikes Peak, and for a couple of years there, and um, yeah, you know, this year 
it wasn't a, a case of us going. We were in different classes. Um, he was on a, a Badger Street fighter, but it was a Panagali V4, and I was on a on a Tuono, which had. Um, but you know, it was a when he went down, and it was him that passed away. That carried with it a huge amount of weight, and um, unfortunately, that that sooner as well rather than. Like, like that would have been the last thing that he would have wanted. He wanted so he would have wanted people to get going, lace up again. Yeah. It up. Yeah. No, it was. Uh, it was that's what he, it was a tough one for me. I think it was a tough one for everyone following the sport. So really good guy because, like, which I'll allude to is like, like he. I mean, for the mo- for most of the competitors. It's there's all road racing. There is a genuine camaraderie, I think, between the guys. Um, everyone, like I've got the photo blown up in my uh, in my living room. Um, you know, just before I uh, snapped the visor down, like ten seconds before I snapped the visor down, and he came up to me, shook my hand, and and uh, one of the photographers just just got, and you know, it was the last time I ever looked into his eyes, and then. Um, we there was a real respect between the two of us, and we, between all the riders, because we all knew how dangerous it was. And um, but there was n- everyone there who did it did it by choice. Like we, there's no one saying that no, you should do this. Oh, it's in your contract. No, no, none of that. You, we did it because we wanted to do it, and it was bloody awesome. <laughs> let me tell you, when that thing sung together, fuck, it yeah, was fun. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Yeah, I think it's important to to remember that. Uh... Everyone, everyone involved was there because they wanted to be there. Uh, mm. You know, sometimes the the corporate side exactly uh, right. gets overshadowed. Uh, it looks like we had to boot Shaheen off the call because it's just, uh, I don't know, live. It's 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 hard. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's working. Not, it's not working. Tell, tell him, uh, man. You got to get on that stream lab. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. Yeah, we're gonna have to compare notes afterwards because obviously I've got a bit to learn still uh, in putting this all together. And, uh, you guys are, you guys at cycle news are just up in the game. You know, that's, I'm just, I'm just trying to catch up. Thanks mate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a one man van versus a three man van. So, oh my gosh. Uh, we're, we're all running on thin these days. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see if there's anything in the comment section here. Uh, that, 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 I got to scroll through everyone telling me everything's broken. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh man. We were supposed to go endurance racing there this year, uh, Renny. We were. We're, I don't know if we're going to get to do that or not. What do you, what do you think the state of like amateur racing is going to be this year? How are I, uh, or I should say, how's it down there? Cause I know how it is up here. Uh, it doesn't, as far as I'm aware, it's not happening at all. Um, I, yeah, I'd be very surprised if we see any racing at least for, I mean, cause we're going into summer as well down in SoCal. So, you know, they usually have a bit of a break um, between kind of June to sort of September, really, just because it's so damn hot. I mean, Chuck Waller doesn't run in that time. I think there might be some rounds. There might be around a Button Willow and there might be around at um, Fontana uh, and maybe even one at Willow. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I know if people are just busting to get back out and go ride, like, you know, I'm not telling anybody who's watching this anything new. Like everyone just wants their life to get back to right, normal, right. and uh, you know they just want to go out and do stuff again. And I mean, I just want my supermoto bike and go and you know do skids and wheelies and and just have a and just enjoy life like for what it was. But yeah, we were supposed to do endurance racing, which is a real bummer because I think we would have kicked some ass this year. It would have been uh, yeah, team team Troy, team Jensen, team <laughs> Rennie would have been a would have been a kicker. So. Uh, but you know, it's like we'll hopefully get something happening at least by you know August, September, just to inject a bit of fun back into life. You know, <laughs> like I mean, we have a good we have a good life being bike journos, but we still like to go out and go ride and go and hang out. That's the whole reason you do this job. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, for starters, the factory Kramer racing team would have decimated. We would mm-hmm. have um, just been a wrecking ball, obviously. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the thing up here with our club is, you know, the, the big debate is whether or not 
first, everyone wants to go racing, but how many people still have the money to go racing? Uh, Cause there's so many layoffs yeah. and there's so many, uh, so much uncertainty and, you know, you just, you know, everyone wants to go, but I mean, that's actually the thing. Do like, it? yeah, that, that's always one with racing. <laughs> so it's like, it's probably the third most expensive sport behind bloody boat racing and car racing. You know, <laughs> like it's just, it's so expensive. And even at a basic club level, it still costs so much money. I mean, there's no way I could race if I didn't have from a few guys that have helped me out over the years, and namely Pirelli uh, and Oscar Solis. But, like, uh, um, you know, you, if so many people want to do it, a few people. And as you, you say, like, we've now got this added, added thing into the mix of it just being such a really stressful time for everybody job layoffs, lack of money, you know, whatever it is, motorcycle racing is an absolute luxury when it comes to the necessities of life. So maybe we might take a bit of a hit for at least the next year. Who knows? Um, might go back to normal straight yeah, away. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that's so weird, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, how do you how do you look at the motorcycle industry? Is this going to be like 2008, 2009 all over again where we have just like years of no bike development? Or do you think people are going to snap right back to it? What's your take? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't think there's. I don't think we're going to have no. Um, I think it, yeah, it's going to hurt us a bit, but I don't think it's going to hurt us quite to the level that the GFC did. Um, obviously, it's a stressful time. We've seen so many. I'd never heard of the word furlough until this year. <laughs> I was like, "What the hell is a furlough?" You're British, don't you know like this language? Come for on. My two-year-old. Yeah. I'm just like, what the hell is this? But, um, yeah, like, there's so many people furloughed and job loss and all that. Um, development was surely slow. But I think the manufacturers have probably learned a few lessons mm -hmm. out of all this. Like, the Japanese really got hurt big time in GFC because they took their foot off the gas so hard when it came to bike development. And the Europeans went and they put it down. And we saw it in the sport bike segment where... Yeah, like the BMW just came out and just smacked everybody. Um, yeah, and that was because they kept their foot on the gas in that time. And the same with the RS before Aprilia. Um, you know, the we didn't see really much coming from Honda, Yamaha. Um, Kawasaki bought out a new bike in that time. Uh, Suzuki basically were the same deal. Uh, so you know, you, I hope I hope that they're not going to take their foot off the gas. I mean, I'm an avid asphalt and rubber reader, as you well know, and saw the latest man, thing on man. the CBR 600 double R R R R R or whatever they're bloody yeah. calling it. Um, hopefully, they bring that out. Um, but I'm looking forward to. I'm a diehard Bermuda fan. Uh -huh. I love the motors. Yeah. I think they're the hottest looking things. They used to ride like shit, but they. Are so much fucking good, so much fun to look at, and so beautiful, like old Debbie ones and all that. God damn, beautiful, good looking bike. So I hope that you that you're right in that. What is it, the KB4? Yeah. That the kind of yeah, retro that one thing. I hope that. Yeah, man, that's hot. Like I hope that comes out. And, um, I remember I rode the the 1098 version and uh, the DB. Seven, I think it seven was. Eight, I can't yeah, remember what the name of those. Seven it or came eight. out with like three of we them at the same time, so it's hard to keep track. Yeah, yeah. I remember riding that back to back with the 1098, and I was like, what is this thing? Like, it looks so good, but it just rode so bad in comparison to a, to a real Ducati. <laughs> but I'd take the I'd take the the, the Vermoda any day in terms of the looks. Like, it was just the best looking bike. But. Yeah, I'm hoping that they they've maybe they might have struck a little bit of uh, gold with this deal with Kawasaki. I mean, I really hope they they come out with something. I good. really like that deal. I think like one, I was really yeah. impressed. I've been really impressed with Kawasaki's moves lately. Like coming out with their supercharged line is kind of crazy. The um, the 250 cc in line four bike, the the ZX 25R, that's crazy. Yep. But their their investment in Bamoda is crazy. Like they're they're taking some chances. I think they're realizing like you can't just be a, a stodgy Japanese motorcycle manufacturer anymore. You gotta you gotta kind of get out of the comfort zone a little bit. And um, sure, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see what what happens with Bamoda. It's such a great brand. It's got such a great story. Yeah, they make beautiful bikes. Um, I'd like to see them do well. Uh, 
Yeah, I would too. Like, I, I think they're a brilliant thing. I mean, to touch on what you're saying about Kawasaki, I mean, Kawasaki arguably has more money than Yamaha, probably not Honda, certainly Suzuki. I mean, Kawasaki Heavy Industries is a massive company. Yeah. Um, so they got the yeah. coin. Um, <laughs> promoted, to, promoted to them as a drop in the ocean. So, you know, hopefully they, they get on there and give them some love and, and get the motor going again because I'm sure with a decent dealer network, decent backup supplies for parts, good engines, you know, those those thousand cc, you know, Z thousand SX motors, man, you can't kill those things with a brick. They're so yeah. solid. So hopefully they get some good love and get that name back out yeah, there. Absolutely. Uh, if I'm giving people uh, the side eye on the streams because I'm reading the comments, Randy, there's a couple questions for you. Um, one mm -hmm. was, you know, going into Pike's Peak, did you feel like you were an underdog or did you feel like you were favored to win? What was your, what was your, your headspace at the time? Um, it was different because we, for starters, we were never originally going for the outright win. Our goal with Aprilia was to win the heavyweight class. This year was going to be uh, shaping up to be something really special because we had Michael Dunlop. Uh, who was turning up there with Lucy Glockner. Um, and for those who don't know Lucy, I mean, everyone knows who Michael Dunlop is, but for those who don't know Lucy Glockner, she's, well, she's not probably, she is the fastest female racer in the world on, on a road bike. Like, that girl's gnarly. Um, and they rocked up with 230-something horsepower BMW HP4 carbon frame bikes. Like, these were fast. These were more powerful than world super yeah. bikes with carbon yeah. frames and full world super bike suspension, like I was looking at these things going, I was looking at my little pea shooter of an RSV4 or a, a, a Tuoto and then looking at those bazookas just going, shit. <laughs> um, and then you had Carlin um, on a you know, relatively hot uh, Panigale V4 with a high bar and those guys were all in the, in the um, uh, unlimited class. So, you know, basically just open slather, run what you're brown. We were in the very much the production class. I went into it wanting to win. Like, for me, I had to win the production class. I didn't think I was going to win the overall, um, but, it, again, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the plan to win the overall. Like, I wanted to go there and win the um, production class, and we, we were real lucky this year. Well, I was just say lucky, but it was good preparation because we had a really, really good team. It's the first time I'd ever had a proper racing team behind me I mean, we had support from Italy. Um, it, it, um, Aprilia flew over one of their techs with a you know, remapped ECU that just unlocked the bike mid, midway through the week. And when I started to get the times down at that point, you know, I was getting quite close to Carlin. Like in some of the sections, I was uh, maybe a second off him or so in sections that in previous years, he was three or four seconds quicker than me. So I thought, oh, maybe. I thought, forget Carlin, forget um you know, about, well, sorry, to give you a backstory, Michael Dunlop didn't show up because he spanned himself in his rally car. <laughs> and um, bloody, uh, and Lucy uh, was originally racing in my category due to a technical infringement or whatever, but they ended up, pro she ended up getting protested and put into Carlin's team. So it was basically her versus Carlin in the heavy, in the, in the unlimited and me versus Cody Vasholtz. Um, I can't remember who else was in there. A few other guys that were in the, in the heavyweight division. And I wanted to win the heavyweight division, and I thought I could. So, yeah, that was the plan. Um, I thought if we were really lucky, we could get a shot at the, at the a shot at the record. But I didn't think we'd go five seconds quicker than the record. So that was a bit of a surprise. And um, when I got over the line, um, you know, I've seen the video a few times where it's like, um, it's, it sounds like I'm crying. I'm not. I'm actually out of breath, and I'm yelling my head off because I just had finally won it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great feeling, but it was very quickly followed by a very bad feeling. So, um, it was, uh, I've got this photo, which my mum showed me actually not long ago. And it's, and uh, you can see, I'm just, it's probably the happiest I've ever been aside from when my son was born and like, and then I saw a photo, someone took a photo on their phone, I don't know, about an hour later and you can see everyone's just like just mm -hmm. completely deflated so it was the highest of highs and the lowest of lows in within an hour so it was pretty no, gnarly. i can't imagine can't imagine at all um 
someone was asking about if you thought about the TT. I, I know the answer to this, but why don't you tell everyone what, what unfortunately you're not doing this year? I'm not doing the TT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it. Are next you? Year. You got that all figured out. Um, yep. Yep. So, um, funnily enough, I had uh, what I, the whole thing came about because I've got a good friend of mine is David Johnson, who um, for the TT fans out there should know him pretty well. He's podium finisher in the Superstock race last year. Um, was factory Honda this year. He was getting um, factory supported BMW. Guy's a weapon of a weapon of a rider, and he and I are very good friends. And um, so I sent him a text not long after the pie because I was feeling pretty good and thought, and I felt like I was riding well. And I thought, well, what if I could get a start at the TT? And so I just flicked an email to to Davo, and and then two days later I had a, um, a I guess a confirmation in in so many words from uh from the tt government basically and um because the tt government are the guys who um who put the put the race on it's it's a purely it's a it's funded by the tt by the by the people it's crazy how that uh, works right like i don't think yeah is macau like that i can't recall i don't think so it's crazy how interlinked the tt is to the manx government oh it's like their number one tourist driver yeah um, you know, when you go there to, I mean, it, it is an incredible place. Like when, when I got there, so I got the, I got the go ahead and say, yes, okay, we're going to support you, uh, effectively, um, as the Pikes Peak winner, we want you to come and race. I thought, great. And they said, what do you want to race? And I said, well, I would like to get on a super spot bike because the super bike around there takes nuts bigger than mine. So I thought I'll give it a. I'll give us the sport a crack, and um, and I'd spoken to Cameron Donald, um, you know, former TT winner, and he's a good buddy, and and he's like, yeah, six hundred's the go for the first year, you know, everything. It's just like everything happens just a little bit slower. And, Why is six hundred yeah. and not a twin? When the lightweight bikes. Um, it's a good question. I, I think a six hundred's probably a little more reliable. Okay. Than anything. Yeah. Um, you know the the twins. Those twins, man, like the 600 or 650 Kawasaki's, they're pumping nearly 100 horsepower out of those things. You know, then I've seen and heard stories of when those things pop. And, I mean, I've seen the video of Davo's one popped on him, um, but he was going in a straight line. He managed to pull a clutch in. And so I was like, man, I ideally, in a perfect world, that would be the bike to do it on, for sure. Because um, you're going fast enough. Um, you're still clocking, you know, 160 mile an hour or so out of the things when they're because they're geared way tall. Um, you know, you you to get through first gear is like you can't feel <laughs> and real long book thing. While you're doing it. But a six, um, yeah, exactly. Like the but the 600s are they come with really good suspension, good brakes, solid motors. That was my main thing. I wanted to make sure that the bike was really, really well put together. Um, I had a meeting with one team while I was over there, a uh, local team that a lot of Australian riders had uh, ridden for, and unfortunately that didn't come off. Um, and so, but they like we we were cool. They just like yeah, it just wasn't the right thing. And I was going in there as a journalist, like I've done with so many of my other races, and we'll be you know telling the story about what it's like to race the TT and. And then I got put in touch with a guy called Paul Rennie, who has the world's greatest last name, and um, <laughs> even spelt the same oh, as my man. name. And we just looked at it and went, oh, this is a match yeah, made in heaven. Two of and, um, there. <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, he's, his PRF racing team has been at the TT since 95, um, run very competitively with his brother, uh, top 10 uh, in the Superbike TT for a number of years, uh, leading privateer team for a very long time. Um, look like they're sponsored by the LA Lakers, like yellow and purple, like pretty wild looking bike. And um, he was like, yep, absolutely. Let's get you going. And he's been fantastic. Just such a lovely, lovely bloke and um, builds very strong bikes, runs an immaculate setup, runs proper. Because the thing, like TT is still very much like a pros and a privateers mm. thing. Like half the field's made up with guys just taking it out of their van. And then you've got, um, you know, big full on, Honda Britain, you know, factory Kawasaki, all that kind of setups, like the big time setups. So his is kind of in between um, and he builds very good bikes. So that was, that was a good chance to get out there and do it on a bike that I felt comfortable on. Um, something that I was prepared to, I thought I could probably wring its neck 
enough that I wouldn't embarrass myself and get out there and have a go. But, I mean, we I went over there in end of November last year, start of December last year, because part of the deal now with the TT is you have to get invited to do it. You can't just rock up right, and do it. Right. That's really changed in the last, um, like, mm, five, ten years or so. Yeah, so I think the rule came in and, whoa, whoops. <laughs> Damn, damn things. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I, I hit my, I hit my blasted uh, uh, headphones. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah, so you you have to get invited to do the TT, and to get invited, you need to go to the Isle of Man uh, and do practice laps. Effectively, like yeah, you know, get to high and um, and just rip around in the high car, um, learn the track. So in uh, six days there, sun up to sundown. I did 28 laps, um, which was just like I was. Pull, I'd pull off at the gooseneck and have a snooze. Pull off at the bungalow, have a snooze, and I'm just like because it does get pretty monotonous. Like you know, you're having you're having bloody gas station lunches and whatever because it was just like I was there to do a job. I wasn't there to drink. I wasn't there to do anything. I just wanted to get as many laps in as I could. Um, and I was with Milky Quail, uh, okay. four-time TT winner, yeah. I think, and uh, and Johnny Barton, who were are the two rider right liaisons. Basically, they're the guys that tick you off. They're the ones that say, "Yep, he's cool, he's in." Um, so, yeah, I was with those guys, and um, but yeah, the place is just like it's kind of everything I'd imagined it to be. You know, you go everywhere is lined with bikes, every street corner, every bloody. Every shop you walk into has pictures of Joey Dunlop and John McGuinness. And, uh, you know, you might go to a little coffee shop or a tea shop or like a bloody whatever, whatever you can, the hardware store, whatever you can think of. And there's pictures of TT stuff and TT heroes. I'm like, this is the place. Yeah, yeah. Like, this, this place is built for motorcycles. It's, it's a really cool place. And, and the thing that always strikes me is the Manx people are like the nicest people in the world. Like they're so hospitable. Like I, I have, I don't want to bore them, but I have like a couple stories of just like people from the Isle of Man bending over backwards to make my TT stay good or just even happen in the first place. Um, it's yeah. just, yeah, I think that's a bucket list item for every motorcyclist because you just words are it doesn't words don't appropriately describe what it's like to stand two feet away from a motorcycle going like 200 miles an hour past you on a on a road and then and then that whole like festival atmosphere that the the island puts together yeah for sure i mean my my family's got a long history in tt dad's done it three times and um he was mike howard's teammate the year that mike came back in that famous 78 formula one tt Uh and the ducati and um so I've always wanted to do it. Um, I remember telling you at the BMW intro we did last year at Barbo that I didn't think I was going to get the chance to do it. And, and you know, I've got a two-year-old son. As maybe you guys can hear in the background, I don't know. But um, so there's – you've got a lot to lose, you know. Like there's – you've got – and so you've got to ride accordingly. Mm-hmm. And you need to um, – you just got to – you have to be smart about it. Like – and the TT now is at such a level – that you're just not going to go in and kick everyone's ass. Like it's just not going to happen. Like you, you need to go there and be smart about it and understand where you can go fast, where you have got to be sensible and just piece it all together. Um, because who knows what happens if you screw up there and it's and and on specialties. But the the everyone that I've ever spoken to about it just say it's the best thing you'll ever do and. Yeah, I've got the. Uh, <laughs> well, I think we're. I don't know what's going on with the feed here. There we go. Are you back? So, the space of a boy to death. I think uh, uh, this is always fun for live shows. Rennie? Yeah, I got okay. you, man. We don't have you so well over here. But uh let's see if I can Yeah, I can yeah? see. You see me? You see my you see my pretty face? Oh yeah. <laughs> and see the face and you hear the dulcet tones. Oh, good. Okay. Um I see in the in in the comment section um 
Shaheen wants to know what uh, is the most frightening animal in Australia? These are the real questions people want answered. Labradors. Labradors. Like the dog. <laughs> like a dog. No. Uh, fright most frightening animal. Fuck. Um, brown snakes for sure. Yeah. yeah. Are you, are you like, oh, do you yeah. have like a natural like fear of snakes or, or is there just something about oh, a brown snake? Bad. Really? So bad. Oh, wow. I have nightmares about it. Oh, wow. It. <laughs> yeah, I do. I don't know where this came from, but like, I mean, like, we. If you're anywhere in the bush that's near water, like, gotta, gotta watch out. Yeah, you know, like, I mean, those things will kill you dead in 50. Um, but, you know, whatever. Um, there's, we always just tell the, we always just try and ham up how bad everything kills you over there because we just want to keep the stupid people out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we do the same thing here in Oregon where it's like, thank you for visiting, but really thank you for leaving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's uh it's funny too like the um you know the snakes are obviously pretty gnarly because the country is so hot but um but he uh i don't know they're all they're all they're all pretty gnarly i mean you get red belly uh sorry you have red belly black snakes and um and then you have um uh, red back spiders those things all those things will mess with you like funnel web spiders and boxing kangaroos and all that stuff <laughs> You saw that. You've seen that um, that clip of the dude, the dude who punches on with a kangaroo. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like some college guy, and he kind of, like, picks a fight with a kangaroo and then just gets walloped. Yeah, well, no, there's one dude where this, where this kangaroo, like, uh, they're big red kangaroo, you know, they're, like, six, six and a half foot tall. Um, got his dog, and he's ripping into his dog. Oh, jeez. And... Um, and the dude goes up to him, cracks him in the head, cracks his bloody, cracks his kangaroo in the face, and then he lets the guy the dog kangaroo is just stunned like that just happened <laughs> but yeah it's it's a fairly unique place australia yeah yeah definitely uh tell me have you had a chance to ride the new uh ducati street fighter v4 no sir i have not oh. um no we are on the seemingly very long list of um people waiting for the singular test bike from ducati um but we'll get a get a crack on it at some point i mean i went on a ride the other day with one in the pack of guys who were riding oh, wow. it, um which was actually michael gilbert from cycle world um so that was interesting um, he wouldn't let you he wouldn't let yeah. you swing a leg over and have a ride yeah it's all right i'm all, I'm, I'm all good i was on an r1m so i wasn't too concerned uh, all right, all right. I was... yep. that's pretty rad yeah that's all yeah. right uh, no, it, it's all right. no, I, we were on the, uh, Panigale V4 launch together. And I remember, I remember yep. talking about that bike with you and like, that's a, that's a hard bike to come up with things not to like. And I feel like the street fighter yeah. V4 is, is very much the same. Obviously they have a, a shared DNA, but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things like, I think Ducati's made a really refined package. Um, it's a really, it's, it's a really good bike, especially in the S, uh, platform with the, the electronic suspension and the wheels. Um, mm. The hardest thing is that price tag. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ouch. But um, like, you yeah. know, I mean, you've obviously spent a ton of time on the, uh, the KTM. Like there's, there's a lot of really good bikes in this segment. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. what always makes it like Big really time. hard for me. You have your Prilia, you have your KTM, you have a BMW. Yamaha makes a good bike in this, in this segment. Like it's kind of hard to outshine. And that Yamaha is half the price of that Ducati. Yeah, and that Yamaha is a bloody good bike. That's probably the most underrated bike that I can think of, really. I mean, everyone knows how good the the Street Fighter is. I'm oh, sorry, the uh, the Super Duke is. Everyone knows how good the Tuono is. Tuono probably for me is well, both the Ducati is so the the Aprilia and the KTM probably my two ideal bikes. I just love them to death. Mm -hmm. But the Yamaha man, like that is a bloody good bike, and that's 13k or yeah. 12 and a half thousand bucks or something yeah. for that for all that performance, like. That thing's sick. Um, and, you know, you're paying twice the price for a V4 Street Fighter. So I hope it's worth it. <laughs> is it? Is it? We'll find out if it's twice as, twice as worth it. Um, you've gotten yeah. to ride the new KTM 890 Duke R. Tell me about that because I haven't had a chance to swing a leg over it yet because I'm that stuck thing up here. Is badass. Yeah? That thing, yeah, that thing is super cool. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a naked bike guy. I always have been. I just 
I like that sort of supermoto y kind of style of thing. And I think that's kind of why I gelled so well with the, the bikes at Pikes Peak. But, um, yeah, man, that's all that bike. Um, it's so nimble. Um, the engine is engine's great. It's 120 horsepower, but it's sparse. Like, super light flywheel just rips through the rev range. Um, but it's super agile. Like, if I saw some – well, I was out shooting it with my editor the other week, and I saw a photo of me banked up how much ground clearance the thing's got. Like, it's – there's a decent amount of room underneath that bike, so you can just wham the thing into corners and keep safe. There's a there's the shot of the press shot of um, – it might be Alex Hoffman. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who it is, but um, he's going through the corner, elbow down, and there's still so much room under the bike. It's ridiculous. Huh. So, like, they've made a really, really good bike with that. Um, I was I when I'm at the, Super, at the uh, Super Duke launch, I was talking with Jeremy McWilliams, who's the lead test rider and probably the best test rider in the world, to be honest. But, um, you know, the, how the, he likes the bike, Excuse me. Um, you know, we wanted to make something super, super agile, and this is a thing I think a lot of the guys are now turning on to. A bit like how, how doing this as well, where they're they're kind of moving away from these gigantic desert slayers, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred things that weigh a ton, to eight hundreds, nine hundreds, seven hundreds, and naked bikes are slowly kind of doing that it's a little bit like like triumph have been pushing that narrative for a little mm-hmm. while with this their street triple um but the the ktm is you know probably at this stage is probably the the lead the lead thing and you know when you put it against something like example i mean it's been a few years since i've ridden an mt09 but i can remember it being not as nicely nowhere near as nicely balanced as as the the KTM, the KTM is a really really cool bike. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before this year, before this model year, since I haven't had a chance to ride the the new KTM, I would have said KTM seven ninety Duke best sport bike on the market. Agree or disagree? Um, no, okay. I wouldn't agree. Okay. What's your pick? Um, yeah, I gotta say the two V four. Look, yeah, V four two I know like. Man, that'll make a man out of sure. everyone. I, I know, I know like, Shane's in the just... comment section, so he's like, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that, that thing is, that's awesome, that bike. I mean, I I'm a, I guess I'm obviously a little biased um, uh, because I got my personal race bike, which was a Toyota, to to feel so good. Like, it was just it was so lovely to ride. Like, um, But as a street bike, as a standard street bike, man, that's Right, it was. It's just so good. It's the best sounding motor I've ever heard from a production bike. That's not like a Desmo Zedici Double R or whatever, something that's completely unobtainable. For something that the average Duke can go, yeah, I'm going to buy that and put a pipe on it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, I haven't seen in your reviews any references to horniness, so uh, I expect that next time. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, you'll get it. <laughs> the, the the only thing I'll rebuttal is. KTM 790 Duke is 10, six or something like that. Tuono V4 factory is like touching 19. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're in terms of for the dollar, the overall packet. Yeah. For the dollar. Yeah. It's pretty hard to beat for sure. Um, the, you know, I mean, I was like my first generation super jerk. That was good. That was awesome as well. Um, I am very, very, very much looking forward to riding that RS660. Yes, um, yes. That thing's going to be sweet. Um, you know, the, again, it goes back to lightness, you know, like because the thing is now super bikes are so bloody fast. Uh, you have 200 horsepower is now basically the, the minimum that you are going to get out of a bike that's got number plates that you ride to go and buy a bottle of milk on, like, that's the stuff that was reserved for World Superbikes not that long ago. And then you throw in the electronics. I mean, that, when we were at that Panigale launch, and they go, okay, here's your, here's your one with the exhaust. <laughs> yeah. It's got 226 yeah. horsepower yeah. or something or other. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's like, fire out, man. Like, I mean, you think that in supercar terms. That's like having a car with 800 yeah. horsepower, uh, and like the, the equivalent thing. And it's just like, man, that's, 
it's just too fast for what most people can use. And the thing that I always loved about 600s, I mean, again, going back to the TT thing, the thing I loved about 600s is like you're the one in control of it. Like you, it will always give you a – Josh Hayes is the best guy to ask about mm. this. I mean, he's riding his, his wife's Melissa Paris's R6 and the, the dude is having the t- – his life. But it's like – I mean, this is Josh Hayes. Like, the guy knows what he's doing. And and, uh, and he just gets on that thing and just comes off with the biggest smile. And it, it's one of those things where, like, you, you know, you don't like getting your ass kicked in a race. It's always fun when you have a battle and you win. You know, like that's always that's always cool. I mean, superbikes are great, and when you ride a superbike and you have a fun with a superbike with all that power, it's great. But when you need to try and screw as much performance out of them as you can, it's better. I will have less weight and a little bit less power than heavier and more power. Like more people can enjoy it with less weight and a little bit less horsepower. For sure, I'm having way more fun racing my Kramer than I would a superbike or, or anything bigger, just because it's. It's For less sure. work. It's 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 more manageable. I feel like I'm actually riding the bike and not the electronics. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I but before I moved to the states, I uh, did the the LZ Championship on a 450. Um, so basically, it was a uh, it was a Yamaha YZ 450F with the same chassis, same swing arm, but with different suspension, different wheels, full bodywork. It looked like a full on Moto 3 bike. Like it, it was like we raced that all around the country and. Um, did the Aussie Championship on it, and man, it was fun. It taught me so much about racecraft um, because that's the thing. Like you, every class has its fast guys. It doesn't matter. Like you know, unless if you're racing at a relatively high level, whether it's in the fast guys in a club race or the fast guys in a national championship race, whoever's at the front pretty much knows what they're doing. Yeah. So if you can get to the front of a chosen event, you will learn so much about racecraft, about managing tires about braking and body kind of stuff all the things that make you a better rider you'll have that in spades when you get to the front of a race so fat chance getting that to the to the front of a moto america race against cameron bobio <laughs> yeah right I and mean, good luck but you might get to the chance you might get to the front of a twins cup a, a clubman twins cup Ugh. try and say that 20 times a clubman twins cup race um, you'll learn a lot by doing that, and you'll have more fun. Well, that's the the thing. Like it's that's why we're doing it, isn't it? Have have a yeah. laugh. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so tell me, tell me about the the eight ninety. Uh, back back tracking a little bit. Um, if you're in the yep. seven ninety. In what ways is the eight ninety better? I mean, outside the spec sheet, it's it's definitely more racy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the front suspension is a lot nicer. Uh, it's stiffer um, for starters. It's got the thing breaks like a bastard. Like as soon as you hit the to the front brake, just whoosh, it just stops. It's almost too much brake for the bike, really? to be honest. Huh. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, I like that. I really love like really heavy brake, like heavy braking, because you know, one of my favorite things to do is you know, correct mid corner lines on the brakes. Like I love doing that. Just like just feed a little bit of brake and pull in tight lines, but. Anyway, um, and the KTM is really good on that because it's super nimble. Um, so, uh, it revs up a lot quicker. It's, a, it's certainly a lot more powerful. Um, it has all the electronics that the new Super Duke's got. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you there's nothing on that bike that isn't on the the premium level Super Duke, which is really cool. I think for for the price point. And the good thing too is that you don't have to buy all that stuff, although it kind of helps. <laughs> Was that a quill pen That's that just walked past you? That's my cat, man. <laughs> Go to Kitty. Everyone wants to see you. Hey, Coda. Hey, buddy. This is the How reason I'm single. There we go. Okay. <laughs> totally just looked like a pen. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, it's the 790. It's just ratcheted up a little bit. Yeah. You know, like the, um, it still has the same, same base chassis. So it doesn't feel, um, but it looks bitching. Like in the metal, it looks really, really cool. And we saw it head to head with the big dog with the, the 1290. Mm-hmm. And the, you really get an idea of just like the physical size of that 1290 versus the little bike. It's like, yeah, that is a big bike. And, um, you know, big 200 section reads. I think it's a 200. On the on the, um, on the Super Duke, twelve ninety, yeah. yeah. 
and then on the little the I think it's a 180 on the on the back of the the 890 and um yeah it's a cool bike it's a they've done really really well with that bike I was actually surprised at how good it rides it's really I'm fun. very I'm very keen to get on it just because of how highly I rate the 790 uh what else yeah. is on your on your hit list for the rest of the year uh, obviously you still have the street fighter before, but is there anything else on your must ride list that you're looking forward to that once we get out of, uh, these lockdown situations and back on the track? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't really know. Um, I mean, for me, hundred percent, the one I'm, I'm going for is the RS660. Yeah. That's the one that I, that's the one I want. Um, and you know, my, my team manager last year, Shane is well aware of how much I want to ride that thing. Um, there, there and, was some uh, talk of maybe a Moto America wild card. Yeah, yeah. there's talk of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll be, uh, you know, there, it will be a very, very good bike for that championship um, because that's the thing. Like all the bikes that, met, that are racing in that championship are basically converted naked bikes. Yeah. Um, that none of them, none of them are purpose built street bikes straight off the bat. So. Um, Interestingly, with that RS660, it doesn't have a link on the rear suspension. It runs straight off the swing arm. So um, I'm keen to see how that's going to mm -hmm. feel. Um, but, yeah, I think that bike's going to be bitching. Um, I still haven't ridden the CBR1000 RRRRRRSP. It kind of sounds like you have a stutter when you say it. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of a stammer. Yeah, so I mean, from like Michael Gilbert, as far as I'm aware, is the only one that's ridden it, and he says it's it's awesome. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, I am keen to try. Well, actually, I've already tried it. Um, the Tenere 700 yeah. adventure bike, the Yamaha 700. I rode it in Australia when I went home to get my new visas, oh, my new Trump cheating. stamps. And yeah, uh, so my dad had one actually on his magazine. He goes, "You want to go for a ride?" I'm like, yep. And, and that's a big, springy, tall adventure bike. Um, did you like it? Yeah, and that's that's. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I thought it was fun. Uh, it's super basic. You know, when you when you're talking what bikes are now and they're laden with it, with electronics, this thing is very much a back to the old school way. Um, no power modes. I mean, this thing didn't even have an ABS because huh. um, of the 19 model. In 2020, it has to have unswitchable ABS thanks to Euro 5, which is now around the world, basically. Um, but, yeah, it's a big, tall, springy, soft, bloody old school bike, really. Um, and that motor is great. You know, I mean, I've seen dudes do some really cool things with that engine. It's strong as hell, that bike. So, so that'll be super cool. Um, I don't know. I mean, other than that, there's there's not much else that I've not sort of been privy to, really. Like, I think there's going to be some good bikes that'll be coming out at Eichner. Um Again, I want to see that 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 Bermuda. Um, I would like to see Bermuda in America. Yeah, right. Well, that would be that, that'd be great. Um, MV Augusta. I'm also really keen on like some of the stuff they've been doing. I really like how they've pivoted their business model. A little bit to being a bit more exclusive, kind of almost Aston Martin-ish in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that really suits them rather than trying to be all bikes to all people. Um, you know, I think that that sort of style of of deliverance really works for them. Um, BMWs, I'd love to ride an unfettered, or like a an unrestricted S one thousand double R because the guys I was just talking about them, that so. today. Yeah. I got to ride yeah. one in uh, Spain right before the lockdown. And actually, what am I talking about? I have ridden one, but I haven't ridden one here. Yeah. I, I rode one in Spain. Yeah, too. you can't. You can't uh, get them here. It's it, uh, that bike had a lot of potential and then just got ruined for the American market. It's a oh, tragedy. Man, didn't know what. Like I, I was like, I was genuinely concerned at the launch because I was just like, is it me? Like, what's wrong with this thing? And then. Uh, and, and Troy Sahan was saying the same, and I think you were saying yeah. the same. And yeah, we're at Barber. Wahid right? was saying at Barber, yeah. And I mean, I, I was just like, "What the hell is wrong with this thing?" And then, then we found out it was all to do. And I feel so bad for BMW because they, it's not their fault that this is the case. And it's like, you know, they well, BMW they USA. Design, well, BMW USA, yeah, yeah. Because I would say yeah, it's like, very much BMW Germany's fault. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, you got to feel so bad for them because, like, they have this awesome bike. I mean, that thing is a gnarly bike, and and they just, you know, it's like taking a taking the bull to the ring and then chopping his nuts off. It's just like, it's not it's not cool. And um, I felt I felt really bad for them because I had at that point previously had ridden the one that was the Euro one, which had a pipe on it and everything. I'm like, bloody hell, this thing's yeah. fast. But, really weird feeling with the suspension because it's yes. super electronic that suspension so that's the thing like typical bmw fashion you have to pay for all the extra like things you actually want but like i love electronic suspension on the street i think it makes a ton of sense that's why i say like street fighter v4s absolutely because you get that electronic suspension aprilia putting mm. it on the tuono uh, factory now absolutely great idea because it's a street bike but for track focused bikes i just don't gel with any of the electronic suspension packages especially bmw's yeah, it's weird. It's a really wooden, disconnected feeling. Um, the I remember when the first HP4 came out in, in 2012, I'm going to say. Sure. Um, yeah, and that was the first SUV bike, as far as I was aware. That was the first SUV bike with electronic suspension. And I was like, what the hell is this thing doing? Like, it felt like it rebounded in the middle of the corner for no reason, like it under brakes, and then it would pop back up on you. And and I was like, what the hell's going on with this thing? And uh, I still, that OG HP4, man, that thing is hot. You like that uh, Quasimodo kind of winking at you look? Yeah, dude, the color scheme on that oh thing, like, dude, so sick. <laughs> like, it almost, like, like, I was, it looked like, um, remember Yuichi Wii? You, you Yuichi Wii, the 125GP racer back in the, early 2000s on the uh -huh. Yamaha, silver and blue Yamaha. Uh -huh. Like that was basically the production version of those colors. And I'm like, man, that's cool. Okay. But yeah. All right. Anyway, I'm show, my, show my geekness on that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that uh, that BMW is good. Uh, that R, just you, you touched on it, that RS660, that's a class killer. That thing. Oh, man, for sure. Decimation. It's going to smash it. Yeah. Yeah. That will crush it. Like uh, the, and, the best thing that I, well, I can't say it's going to happen, but I so hope it does. It blitz everything, and then it's going to force everybody else to yes. take that section of the market seriously. Yes. Um, you know, I, was, I did an interview the other day with Alessandro Valia, mm -hmm. um, from his lead Ducati test rider, as we all know from our time there, who's just an animal on a motorcycle. And, and I said, dude, you have to develop one of these things. Like, you've basically got the motors already yeah. there. You know how to do it. I told Claudio like, the same exact thing. I was like, "Listen, your yeah, your your boys down the street it. are doing it. Why can't you?" Mm. And there's such a there's such a hole in the market because people still like sports bikes. Um, you know, like I'm a sport bike guy through and through. I'm a motorcycle guy, but I love sports bikes and I love seeing you guys get on it. Um, and I think that RS is just gonna crush it because it's i mean the probably the best handling sports bike i've ever ridden is an rs 250 two stroke um like that thing was just f like water it's just so beautiful to ride but the this will be i'm hoping this is going to be the 21st century version i guess of the rs 250 and um yeah i think it's just gonna wallop the bloody uh twins cup class i said to was it chuck axel or someone i said to him okay you ready for i oh, know it's paul carruthers i'm like you ready for the Moto America to become an, an Aprilia Cup next year. Yeah. They're, they're going to have to ban it because otherwise it is going to be a spec class. Like, like everything else in that class is pretty much decades old technology, and it's just kind of like oh, for sure. you're yeah. kind of just winging it. You know, SV six fifties are great bikes. Like, I can't pick of a better starter track bike or even like a better street bike to to cut your teeth on, but it's not a race bike. Mm. You know, and, and like you can no. try and do all the things in the world you want to it, but like a hundred horsepower out of an SV650 is, you know, a matchstick. That thing's going to go that's like straining. fire. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the RS660 is just straining. doing that no problem. Like just stock. Yeah. Have you have you seen the the TT race bike, the Patton? Yeah. The 650 yeah. Patton? Man, isn't that a hot looking yeah. thing? Yeah. Those things have really come on. I remember, I think... I think my first TT was the first year they raced there. And I remember everyone in the paddock being like, oh, it's Chinese. It's going to blow up. These things are garbage. And look where they are now. Yeah, they won it, yeah. I think, last year or the year before or something. Uh, with Rudder, I mean, right? I, yeah. Maybe? It was either Rudder or Dunlop, one of the two. 
the the one I'm I'm hoping that will get cracking again now that it's got some Chinese investment is Norton. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really hope that they can get that ball rolling because I think they were just starting to get on the point where it was all systems go and then it all went. That story is crazy. Isn't it? What? (laughs) Far out. Man, it almost reads like a bloody crime novel, that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even want to, I don't even want to go there. Um, Let's get our last questions in from the comment section. If you guys have anything, post them up and Rennie will do his best American accent when he answers them. Oh man, forget (laughs) it. (laughs) Not a chance. I can barely do an Australian like someone beating the crap out of something. Yeah. Forget it. <laughs> uh, I am very, I'm very curious to see how that uh, Tenere 700 goes. Um, yeah. Do you, I mean, the pricing on that for me is killer. But what I want to know from you is, does it have the off-road chops? Is it a proper off-roading adventure bike? Um, look, I've got to preface that with saying that I didn't ride it full-on gnarly off-road. I rode it some dirt roads and a little bit a few pieces here and there um i look from from what everyone tells me like i know some guys in australia that have done some decent miles on and they all say it's pretty good but it depends adventure bikes uh it depends on how hard you really want to push and most guys like we all know most guys they go and do the next long way around but they never do um so the, i mean the what the the yardstick in the class is for sure, the 790 Kevin KTM 790 Adventure, like that thing is, that thing's so good. Um, and they've got Quinn Cody was the one that basically developed the thing. Um, they certainly developed the suspension, excuse me, um, which was a. I mean, when I jumped on that thing in Morocco and rode, I was like, man, this is good. Like, this is a really good bike. Um, you know, probably a few too many electronics for guys that are going to want to go out there and do big, big adventures on them. Um, but I think. The Yamaha has to stick. Um, it'll definitely be, be an, uh, um, considering that they've had a marketing campaign for that motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. Um, Marcus from Yamaha a year and a half ago. I'm like, when's it coming? He's like, oh, another three and a something years. I'm like, yeah, what? what? Sorry? And then he was like, yeah, I know. No. And just forget it. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a, – it'll be a very good bike. Um I think what they'll end up seeing is it'll be a good base bike to be able to then throw a whole heap of personalized mods at, Um, you know, versus something like a GS, which pretty much comes with most of the fruit that you're going to want, but also comes with a very high price tag. Um, And with a lot of stuff that is governed by electronics, because you don't want to have, if you are one of those guys, and I do hope to do this one day, I mean, I've always, I said to my wife, one of the things I want to do before I die is take our son on a, like cross across America or you know wherever like big big adventure ride and you don't want electrics electronics to screw up in the middle of nowhere and you're not being able to fix them like it would fix it so that's where the good thing with that 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 Tenere is it is a very mechanical uh mechanical bike like you there's no traction to that I mean there will be ABS when it comes out um but that's you know pull a fuse um or you just bypass the whole thing um It'll be a, a good base bike, I think, and hopefully, I mean, what, what have, they have priced it, haven't they? In the US, they've, yeah, they've it's, sub, it it's sub ten. It's nine, 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 nine. How many nines is that? Four nines. Four nines, yeah. Okay, so four nines is not a bad price for something like that. Even if, like, you you say you take you, you go four nines, and then you say, right, I've got a twelve grand budget. Um, throw three grand's worth of, you know, very careful for calculated mods dude you've got a bike that will take you very far um which will be there'll be when we did that 790 ride in morocco um we saw a whole bunch of 660 10 arrays that passed us it was about 10 of the bloody things this is in morocco like ass end of nowhere in morocco and i'm like man those things are still yeah. going and that's going to be the the new thing with uh with for yamaha a bit yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, I'm very curious about that bike because um, that segment has always been looking for something that is looking for something that's slightly more like a dirt bike. And KTM came out with a 790, yeah. put it together a great package, but it's still a little on the pricier side. And then Yamaha 
comes right in and just undercuts them. But if they've got the chassis and the motor side figured out, you know, that could really give some KTM buyers something to think about. Like you said, with like, you could price it out with two, three thousand dollars of, of add-ons and, and still probably come out cheaper. Yeah, for sure. And that, I mean, the thing is too, it is a big bike. Like you can't remember what the, the seat height is, but it's super tall. Like I remember getting, I was like, whoa, all right. I mean, I'm six. Yeah. One, you're not short. And yeah. So it's like, and I, and I was sitting there going, geez, this is a big bike. And, but the, because it has that awesome CP, the CP2, CP3 motor, the Are, the are you trying to get Yamaha. me some Yamaha marketing speak with the cross plane twin? Yeah, yeah, all that stuff, yeah. That, yeah, that chill, yeah, come on. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the last time I rode one of those engines, it threw me off and I got knocked out. But that was because I screwed up doing a wheelie. Um, sorry, Marcus. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, like that engine is engines that you can buy in the car market. Like we've seen it in flat track racing bikes, we've seen it in custom builds, we've seen it in Moto America, um, Twins Cup yeah. bikes. So versatile. Like, it's so versatile. Yeah. And there's no and, and it's great in an adventure bike for, for the very limited riding that I've that I've done mm. on it. Um, it's a excellent little motor. Um, so you, you know that it's definitely better that they took that route rather than take the three cylinder. Yes. Um, cause it, yeah, because that three cylinder is a bit of a angry little snappy motor kind of deal. So, but see, the seven hundred twins are much better. Yeah, bike. I think a twin just in general is like anything more than two cylinders for an adventure bike feels like too many. Yeah, pointless. Yeah, like the, the, it's, you know, like you got to wing it. Um, you get a big. Uh, that's why big, big adventure bikes don't sell like what they used to sell. Like they've become touring bikes yeah. really touring bikes that could do the odd you know here and there i mean you see the guys that are gnarly dudes like adam Riemann and those guys in, in australia that take 1290 adventures and just ride them like motocross bikes but they are the absolute top end of the spectrum most of those bikes barely see a dirt road but you get a sub 1000 cc bike sub 900 cc bike that Again, it goes back to the lightness and a little bit less horsepower and more agility becomes easier to ride because you know you get on a you get on something that doesn't bite you. You want to get back on it. If it bites you, you don't yeah, want to get on it. Absolutely. I, that's why I worry about the the Multistrada V4. I feel like that's no mm -hmm. longer going to be an adventure bike. Not that the Enduro no. hasn't kind of like assumed some of that role, but like that's going to be, I feel a, a, a sport terrain model. By the time it comes out, how many how many uh, multi strata enduros have you seen doing multi strata enduroing? Well, I mean, I got a podcast host that takes uh, his out all the damn time onto the dirt roads, so I see it quite a bit. But uh, yeah, um, but I, I I I get your point. Like you know, it's not a model you see on the trails very often. And truthfully, I think that's Ducati's fault. I think that's Ducati yeah. Italy and I think US and not marketing that bike because it's 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 no worse at doing the adventure thing than a GS is or any of these other big adventure bikes. In, in my opinion, I think no. it's just as capable as any of them. And the lack of sales and lack of popularity just comes down to, to maybe marketing. I, I don't know. I always sort of look at that one and I don't know that it really fits Ducati as a company. Um, I certainly think the multi strata range definitely does, but the Enduro, I'm like, no, I don't the perfect fit for them. Um, but it's not, a, as you say, it's not a bad bike. Like I've ridden a bunch of them and they are fun, but they're just big bikes. They're big, heavy bikes and they're difficult to, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a GS or a KTM or a buddy V Strom Suzuki, you know, like they're, they're not designed to go into tight trails and, um, you know, you can, they're designed to put panniers on the back of them and put the, the the better half on the back and you know go for a big long ride on some dirt roads. That's what they're designed to do. They're not. And then you, if you really want to go adventure riding and really get out there, get yourself a sub thousand twin, throw some good suspension at it, and off you go. I mean, there's there's literally no way you can't go. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's interesting. There's um. Do you know uh, Simon and Lisa Thomas? You heard of those guys? No, I don't think so. They're um, so the thing there's a they have a website to ride the world, mm. 
um, to ride the wheel. Um, they've been riding now for, what are we going, 2020. I think they started in 2002 and they're still going. Wow. Uh, That's insane. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Absolutely incredible. Um, when I, before I moved to America, I had my own adventure magazine and I met them when they were on a stay over in Australia. I mean, they've been going so long now that they don't have any residency in any country. Um, no, they're just just nomads on bikes. And um, Lisa has been on, she was originally on a 750 GS and now she's on an 800 GS. Uh, Simon's on a, on the big dog on the on the 1250 GS. But um, yeah, I mean, she, like, she has the perfect adventure bike and it can just, it's taken them around the world so many times. Um, so it's a, uh, um, yeah, it's uh, sorry, my 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 boy is bashing on the door, as you can hear. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, mate. Hang yeah. on a sec. <laughs> yes, buddy. Uh, sorry. That's adorable. Yeah, he's. Uh, I, I've, I've I've locked him out of the house, out of my bedroom, and he's he's bashing on there, asking me to come and play with him. Well, we'll wrap it up real yes, uh, real quick here. Let's just do one more. Uh, tell everyone real quick what's in your garage. What are you riding right now? Uh, right now, I've got a Z900, um, Kawasaki Z900, and I have my uh, Darling Supermoto, my F- S450 Husqvarna Supermoto, which I love. 